Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. The different yogas are all these different ways to remove the second arrow, the real cause of suffering. And each yoga has its own paradigm, the way it sees the problem and the solution it offers. The path of bhakti says the problem is we do not have faith in God, we do not have trust and surrender and love for God. And the solution is bhakti, devotion to God. The way of karma, karma yoga says our whole problem is this terrible attachment to body and mind and selfishness. And the solution is to transform our lives, make it completely unselfish. Then the path of Raja Yoga, which you have taken up now, it says it's not so much a question of selfishness or unselfishness, or not so much a question of believing something or not believing something, faith or no faith. Rather, we do not experience the reality as it is. We do not experience ourselves as pure consciousness, which is not subject to the second arrow. Which is not even subject to the first arrow. If you are not subject to the first arrow, you are not subject to the second arrow also. You are not a body, hence not subject to old age, disease and death. You are not even the mind, not subject to confusion, sorrow and disappointment. You are an immortal awareness, consciousness. You do not know this, you do not see this, therefore all problems. Then why do we not see this? The, result, the uh, answer is that the mind is disturbed, is constantly being thrown into waves and it obscures what lies beneath or beyond the mind, the, the consciousness, our real nature. So the solution will be, problem is restlessness of the mind, solution is calmness of the mind, concentration, focus, serenity of the mind. So this is the path of meditation. Um, Swami Vivekananda called it Raja Yoga. It's based on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. So yesterday we saw the background of it, the nice stories of Hiranyagarbha and Patanjali and so on. That's why if often in yoga books, books which are translations of Yoga Sutras, for example, you will see a depiction of the multi-headed serpent and Patanjali sitting. So that's the background of the story, why that, that kind of iconography is used. So Yoga Sutras. Yesterday I offered a practical, a set of practical points for meditation, which are very helpful for meditation. Whatever your meditation practice, those 10 points which Ashokanji mentions are really good. Uh, but today there's the heavy stuff. I won't say the boring stuff, but <laughs> the heavy stuff. The Yoga Sutras themselves. We will do four sutras, the first four sutras. And the first sutra is the introduction to the Yoga Sutras. It is, well, what is the text we are taking up? Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is the oldest manual of meditation we can find. So the first sutra is Atha Yoga Anushasanam. Let me write it down. Yoga Sutras. Sutra number one. Atha, in this is Sanskrit. Yoga Anushasanam. This is the sutra. See, the sutra literature is that a huge amount of information, a full knowledge system, is packed into a few cryptic uh, statements. And of course, in those days, it was all Sanskrit. Basically, the core scriptures of the Hindus are the Vedas. And the final, highest philosophical, spiritual teachings of the Vedas are found in the Upanishads, which are found in the Vedas themselves. But after the Vedic age came the age of philosophy. So these philosophical systems 
based on, originating from, or in dialogue with, sometimes contradicting Vedic teachings, came the various philosophies. There were many, many philosophies in India. And uh, there was a time when all these philosophies were condensed and codified in sutra literature. So sutras are very cryptic. In, in English you will call them aphorisms. Um, they are actually not aphorisms. They are more like, you know, in a computer you have zip files. A lot of information is packed into something. Um, so a lot of information is packed into these sutras. And every system of knowledge, they developed this, this sutra. It was a good way of systematizing it, conveniently packing all the information into an um, easily memorizable form. And then the teachers would explain it. It requires explanation. Because it's so cryptic, what does it mean? If you go straight to the sutras, often it's not all that clear. So it requires explanation. What does this sutra mean? This is the first sutra of the Yoga Sutras. There are 195 sutras in the Yoga Sutras. Atha Yoga Anushasanam. Atha means now or hem, hence now. Now. Yoga. Yoga means yoga. <laughs> anu means after or sequence. And shasana means teaching, instruction, teaching. So teaching about yoga. Now is presented the teaching about yoga. After means that it's a matter for decoding. After means, some say it means after the tradition, in the tradition of stretching all the way back to that guy on the lotus, Hiranyagarbha. Uh, from Hiranyagarbha, who discovered the method of, me of meditation, uh, to, uh, down to Patanjali, who is writing this, who is codifying this knowledge. So in that sequence. Another meaning of Anushasanam, if you take them together, is the text. Now, the text about yoga. One of the commentators, Vachaspati Mishra, says that Anushasanam is... Um, uh, sh shas um, Anu means anena, by this. By this yoga is taught. By this means by this text. So Anushasanam actually refers to the text also. That's also possible. Now this is the usual style in which the sutra literature begins. For example, um, and there are a lot of sutra literature. There is Brahma Sutras for Vedanta, which is uh, bigger, 555 sutras. This is, this is only 195. There is the Bhakti Sutras of Narada, a little bit of which we will see tomorrow which is much smaller, 84 or 85. There is the, the, the Karmakanda Sutras, the Jaimini Sutras, which talk about the various Vedic rituals, which is much bigger. There is the Grammar Sutras we talked about yesterday, for which Patanjali wrote the commentary, part of which was eaten by the, by the goat. So, uh, th that is huge, nearly 4,000 Sutras. So, these um, Sutras, they usually begin like this. For example, the first sutra of the Brahma Sutras is Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Hence, therefore, an inquiry into Brahman. Notice there are slight differences. Inquiry into Brahman. But here, instruction about yoga. Instruction is something that you have to carry into practice. What does inquiry lead to? Any kind of knowledge, yes, correct. And if you inquire into something, you get to know something. There it is implied in Vedanta, I'm jumping ahead to the next class. In Vedanta it is implied that the goal is to know this. That will solve your problem. Here it's, it's not that you have to know something. Knowledge is important, but after that you have to, any kind of instruction, any kind of teaching you have to transfer into practice. So Anushasanam, it is being taught, yoga is being taught. Hopefully you will practice it later, so yoga is being taught. Now, these sutras, in order to understand them, you have to look at the commentators. Many um, great scholars, yogis came after Patanjali. They took up these sutras and commented on it. So the foundational commentary, the one which everybody should go to if you are seriously interested in investigating, anybody who studies them also, you go to what is called the Vyasa Bhashya.
commentary by vyasa bhashya means commentary vyasa bhashya commentary by vyasa vyasa so when we studied the yoga sutras when we were novices we studied it with vyasa with the vyasa bhashya um what do they do in these commentaries they take up each word of the sutra and they examine it etymologically from the grammar point of view they examine it philosophically what does it mean in the whole philosophy they examine it um, uh, contextually in that particular context what does it mean so in many of these ways semantic the meaning of the particular word so grammatically the semantically philosophically contextually each word is examined and the whole sutra is interpreted that's the job of the commentator so we understand what it means so the original commentary on this is vyasa bhashya the original commentaries are called bhashyas so for example brahma sutra the the sutras for the vedanta our system and the commentary was written by shankaracharya and of course by many others and another commentary was writ written by ramanuja another commentary was written by madhvacharya and yet another one by vallabhacharya and so on different commentators have written commentaries for yoga the oldest and the most comprehensive commentary is by vyasa this is what so if you ask where are you getting these meanings from here and then afterwards there were some other commentaries also interestingly shankara shankaracharya he wrote a commentary which i have not studied a little bit of doubt is there whether it is the same shankara who is the advaita teacher uh, or is it something somebody else um, modern scholars they will find some difference in the commentator so they too must be different though i have the same name i am afraid that 500 years later they will say there were many vivekanandas because if you see the complete works many types of teachings are there so there is one vivekananda who was a teacher of bhakti another vivekananda who was a teacher of yoga they might do that that's what scholars are up to so shankara he wrote a commentary then there is another um, great scholar vachaspati mishra he was a scholar of course many of these scholars in ancient india were also spiritual practitioners um this name you keep coming across in indian philosophy uh, because he was a very great uh, master of all the systems there is a term for him sarva tantra swatantra acharya uh, tantra means here not tan tantra of the tantric philosophy it means philosophy system of philosophy sarva tantra swatantra the one who has independent access to all systems of thought so he has the password for all the networks <laughs> all the sutras he has written masterful works on each system so he has written a work on yoga he has written a work on sankhya and uh, he has written a work on purva mimamsa he has written a work on nyaya vaisheshika but his what he is famous for his his commentary on uh, vedanta on brahma sutras shankara's commentary on brahma sutra and vachaspati mishra's commentary on shankara's commentary on brahma sutra so he is famous for that but he has written a very useful commentary for this and i will use some of his insights another one very well known vigyana bhikshu um he interprets the yoga sutras and introduces many elements of vedanta into it so some some people have said swami vivekananda has commented on the yoga sutras he so he is one of the first english commentaries on the yoga sutras swami vivekananda which was published which have the book you have got here which was published first from the vedanta society of new york but some have said that but he is giving a vedantic interpretation of yoga but that vedantic interpretation of yoga goes way back about 500 years ago vigyana bhikshu did that he gave a vedantic interpretation of yoga and we had a professor speaking at the vedanta society of new york recently andrew nicholson who has done major work on vigyana bhikshu he has a whole book on the work of vigyana bhikshu uh, andrew nicholson is right now in princeton but he is originally from rutgers i think um then vigyana bhikshu there was one king i think he was between vigyana bhikshu and uh vajaspati mishra bhoja raja he was a king but a, apparently a very multi talented prodigy 
he was a poet and a composer and and also a philosopher and a yogi who is said to have attained uh, enlightenment so a bit like janaka raja <laughs> but he's a historical figure well known he wrote a commentary i think raja Mar- martanda on on the yoga sutras which is also supposed to be a brilliant commentary but i have not read that and then in our own time hari harananda aranya uh, aranya hari harananda aranya he was a monk i mentioned him yesterday the one who when you become the head of the order you are walled up in a cave and the food food is sent to you and once in a week you give audience to to the hole in the cave you can ask a question so that guy uh, his commentary is a modern commentary but it's now used he wrote it in i think the originally he wrote it in bengali but it's it's basically what he has done is he has taken the yoga sutras and the vyasa bhashya original one and given a very detailed modern introduction to it but tough so that's the one which is used in philosophy departments in the universities now and we used it when we studied yoga sutras and then there are many others most famously swami vivekananda himself who has given um, a beautiful powerful introduction to your patanjali yoga sutras he is really responsible for making it so popular in mod- in the modern world today as reading jd salinger the n- novelist uh, catcher in the rye so i had never read that book catcher in the rye and people kept talking about it and salinger is so um, salient shall, shall shall we say to our vedanta movement uh, he so i decided to read it just last year i didn't like it and then i couldn't finish it and then uh, somebody said swami it's too late it's something you should read when you're a teenager <laughs> it's teenagers <laughs> like it's uh, not at your age it's of course a very good book but but for kids um jd salinger says in one place there are these two classics karma yoga and raja yoga which our modern american youth of course he's talking in the 1960s i think 50s probably 60s our modern american youth would do well to carry around in their pockets he says raja yoga and karma yoga so this is the commentarial history what else do should i say about this um okay this is the first sutra the meaning of the word yoga yes so yoga has two meanings the original sanskrit see etymology comes how what is the meaning of the word the original sanskrit is yuj good to know because yoga is such a popular word these days what does it actually mean originally the original sanskrit meaning it comes from the term yuj and it has two meanings yuj samadho yujir yoge so one is samadhi meditation one meaning is meditation another meaning is union joining two things yoga means to join two things another meaning is meditation in this case yoga sutras the meaning is meditation this meaning is taken why not this meaning because often people think you know yoga or spirituality is joining the jivatma to the paramatma to the sentient being to the supreme self and so on but not in yoga in yoga yoga means separation not joining the whole problem is we have become joined to material nature you are spirit you have become joined to a material nature you are purusha you have become joined to prakriti your consciousness you have become mixed up with matter and that is that is the whole problem that is samsara so the whole purpose of yoga is to separate purusha and prakriti consciousness and matter to show you that you are not material that you are pure spirit so therefore this meaning of union will not apply in a very loose sense it might apply how um union with your real self you are already the real self pure consciousness just that you don't know it you think you are the body mind 
And so when you know it by the process of yoga, you can sort of indirectly say you have been united with your real self. In that sense, you can sort of stretch the meaning. But really, yoga here means viyoga. Yoga means separation. Uh, separation from material nature. All right. And what else? Okay. Now we go on to the second sutra. First, let's repeat the first sutra. That's how traditionally it is studied. The teacher will chant the sutra and the students repeat it. Atha yoga anushasanam. Atha yoga anushasanam. This word atha also, I can't resist the itch to mention it because, see, there are many things which I did not mention. Traditionally, while studying any kind of scripture, it, it has to start with what is called mangala, an, uh, an auspicious chant. So usually, you'll see we start with a chant. Texts also start with a chant. Usually it's a chant in praise of the guru or bowing down to God or something auspicious. And then you start the study. Now, atha has this meaning. It is auspicious. So om, if you chant, that's auspicious. And one, one other auspicious word is atha. Hence, here it means hence or now an entry into spiritual life. So it's auspicious. So in that sense, mangala, one purpose it serves is to make an auspicious beginning. Bhaktim atha bhaktim athato bhaktim vyakya syamaha. Now we shall explain bhakti, bhakti sutras. But there also atha. Athato brahma jignasa. Now an inquiry. Now hence an inquiry into Brahman. See, atha. But not always. The Shiva sutras of Kashmiri Shaivism, it starts straight away. Chaitanyam atma. Consciousness is the self. Immediately objection will come. Where is your auspicious chant? What's the hurry? <laughs> Where is your auspicious chant? And the answer will be that you are directly referring to the highest reality, consciousness itself. That's auspicious. So, <laughs> that, that way. Anyway, that's not so pertinent. Next. Second, what is, now training about yoga. The question will arise now, what is yoga then? You're going to tra train us about yoga. So what is the teaching about yoga? Before the teaching, tell us what yoga is. Define it. Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. So yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga, mind, modification, cessation. So yoga is, is um, mind, modification, cessation. Yoga chitta vritti nirodha, cessation or quietening. Do you see what I said earlier? It's the turbulence of the mind which is preventing us from realizing our real nature. So yoga, the purpose of yoga is to calm the mind down, to make the mind one-pointed, calm, focused, so that there is no turbulence in the mind. Yoga is the cessation of the modification of the mind. So this requires some explanation. Swami Vivekananda puts it this way. Um, all right, we'll go to that a little later. First, little background. Yoga philosophy is derived from Sankhya philosophy. Yoga philosophy is derived from Sankhya philosophy. And the Sankhya philosophy uh, has, uh, literally the word Sankhya comes from Sankhya, which means number. And so they enumerate the categories of nature. Very ancient philosophy. When the Buddha went out to earn, uh, learn and become enlightened, he got masters, teachers, who were basically some kind of proto-Sankhyan teachers. So what he learned from them, which he was not satisfied with, but the teaching he got was Sankhyan. 
So what is the enumeration? What do they talk about? What are the categories? 25 categories they talk about. Don't worry, don't get tense, 25 categories. Now all of it is not important. Um, most important is Purusha, consciousness. Purusha also literally means male, and that's de a derived meaning, but the original meaning is that, that spiritual being, that consciousness, which we are. Whether you're in a male body, a female body, whatever, we are that consciousness. Body is not important there. So that's one. And there is another category called Prakriti, nature. Remember, we are, this is Sankhya philosophy, not Vedanta. Don't become confused. Don't mix them up together. There's, there are big differences. Purusha is pure consciousness, the self, and Prakriti is material nature. And Prakriti uh, has evolutes. Prakriti evolves into this universe. Prakriti is always changing. It's made of, what is it made of? What is Purusha made of? Consciousness. What is Prakriti made of? Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. The three gunas. Sattva plus Rajas plus Tamas. Now from Prakriti what happens first evolute is, first thing which emerges is called uh, Buddhi. A self-awareness, um, or, or awareness itself, or knowledge, knowing, a knowingness, let us call it. The buddhi, what they're talking about is not literally the intellect which we have now. Another name for that is mahat. From that comes from that comes buddhi, ahankara. The ego, ahankara, ego. So buddhi literal, I mean sort of approximately you can translate it as intellect, understanding or knowingness, and then ego. Interesting. See, already the difference between consciousness and mind are very, it's very clear. Today, this basic understanding is not there or not accepted in modern consciousness studies. Modern consciousness studies is still mixes the whole thing together. Consciousness, intelligence, mind, perception, all of it is called consciousness studies. And there's a reason why they do it, we'll see. Um, and uh, Sankhya and Yoga says, there, li there lies the problem. The inability to distinguish yourself from your mind. Ahankar, ego. And then Manas, mind. And from that comes five sense organs, five motor organs. These are not the actual physical organs, but the powers. Five motor organs, five subtle elements, and five gross elements. If you're wondering what's all that, very complicated, don't worry about it. You can just write it down. Five sense organs, buddhi indriya, jnana indriya. You can write in English, five sense organs. And then if you are writing, then five motor organs. Five subtle elements, in Sanskrit, tanmatra. And five gross elements. What are, um, what are the five subtle elements and five gross elements? Five subtle elements are sky and wind and uh, fire and water and earth. But not in the way we find them, not this sky or not the wind, um, none of this. Uh, in, in a very subtle form, may, almost like a mental form. And then they mix among themselves and form this physical universe which is perceptible to us. Anyway, that's the way they look at it. Notice that the whole universe is seen as emerging from the subject, from inwards to outwards, from consciousness outwards to the universe. What we regard as the universe starts here. It's from these five gross elements that this physical universe is created. Can you tell us the Sanskrit words for the five Indriyas? Yes. Pancha Gyanindriya. Five Gyanindriyas. Then five Karma Indriyas. Motor, motor organs. Five Tanmatras. Pancha Tanmatra. Tanmatra actually in Sanskrit, Tat Matra, that, that much only. 
That means the subtle elements. And then pancha bhuta. Or in Sanskrit, pancha maha bhuta. Bhuta means not ghosts. Here, bhuta means elements. The five elements. You see, it's not just um, a sankhya. Any ancient cosmology, in India, in Greece, in China, they talked about four elements or five elements. Yes. Yes, they are, they are prakriti. This is the constituents of prakriti. Prakriti is made of the three gunas. The, the way they describe it is, imagine a rope. A rope has braids. So imagine prakriti as a rope and it has three braids. Or imagine in our modern, when you look at the depiction of a DNA, uh, you know, like a coiled like that, the strands are coiled with each other, the DNA helix, double helix, like that. The, uh, it also means string. Gunas actually mean strings. Somebody said super strings. Ah, so we have come back to <laughs> the same idea now. And it's interesting. They are extraordinarily subtle. They are the fundamental constituents of nature and they are vibrating. You're almost maybe like a description of super strings. <laughs> and they produce the entire universe. So these three together. Swamiji, what's the term for the motor organs? Um, motor organs, kar karmendriya. Five ganyendriya, five karmendriya, five uh, subtle elements, five physical elements or gross elements. So this is the whole system of Sankhya. And this whole thing is borrowed by yoga. Now why am I saying all this? What is the point? The point is this. These three together, buddhi plus ahankara plus manas is called chitta. <coughs> what, what chitta? This one, chitta vritti nirodaha. So I'm trying to explain where this, what is this, this word? I've translated it as mind, but it's, mind is a very broad term. What does it include? It includes, in our case, our intellect, our ego, the ego that we feel right now, the intellect, the knowingness, the understanding that we feel right now, the, the power of clarity, knowledge, and the ego, and the mind. What are the functions of each? Why, why are we using different terms for them? Because each of them has different functions. The ego in Sanskrit, the function of the, uh, no, function of the buddhi first, function of the intellect, nishchayatmika buddhi, Buddhi is that which gives clarity, understanding, reveals to us. Also it is um, the uh, agency that I do, the doing that, uh, I am doing something, I am the doer of this action. This comes from buddhi, katritva, doing. So buddhi is that function of the chitta which gives knowledge, clarity. I, and manas is that function of the chitta, it's a sankalpa vikalpa atmakam mana. That means when you are considering many things, thoughts are coming in. What the manas does is it collects information from the world outside, to the five sense organs. And uh, it collects information from its storehouse, memory. And it considers many things. Many thoughts come up in it, perceptions are all dumped in it. All the sensors are pulling in information sight, sound, smell taste, touch, and they all are dumped into the manas. And the manas also retrieves information from memory. And it has many kinds of perceptions, feelings, pleasure, pain, and all kinds of subtle related feelings about it. All of this churning goes on in the manas, and when there is clarity, knowledge, flash of knowledge, I get it, buddhi. But they're all part of the same thing called chitta. And what does ahankara, the ego, do? The ego is, in Sanskrit its function is abhimanatmika. Uh, abhimanatmika means appropriating function. That means it uh, identifies. When thoughts are there, I am thinking. When you're seeing some, the sight, sight, eyes giving perception to the mind, what, the, what does the ego say? I see. When the intellect gets a flash of understanding, what does the ego say? I understand. The ego is that which integrates all these functions under one head. What is that head? I. Yeah. So, it's necessary for functioning. Then you feel a sense of integration, that I, I am this one person. I am the one who saw. 
I am the one who thought about it. I am the one who understood. Seeing, sense organ. Thinking, mind. Feeling, mind. And understanding, intellect. And all of that is appropriated, taken up by, owned by ego, I. It gives it, uh, ego, and that feeling of I am doing, the doingness, sense of agency is in buddhi, but the ego says, I do. Hmm. I enjoy. Which one? Between I in buddhi and I in So, I, there's no I in buddhi. Buddhi is understanding. Flash. Got it. But I got it. Yeah. That is ego. But earlier you said buddhi says I did. No. Uh, agency is there. The doing it. I, that, uh, the doer. Doership is in, in buddhi. Katritva. And the ego comes and joins says I do it. The sense of execution, buddhi feels that, I, uh, that uh, the agent, it's the agent. And then uh, ego comes and says, I am the agent. The agentship is taken up by, understanding in the buddhi is taken up by ego and says, I understand. <coughs> Notice, these are subtle differences of functions. Uh, but these differences are there. If you just note it, you will see differences are there in the mind. Ego feels like one function. Understanding feels like another function. Uh, memory feels like another function. Uh, thinking, emotions, another function. Multiplicity of perceptions, another function. Uh, and the doing things through, sense or, through motor organs, another set of functions. All of that is integrated and it's one inner organ. It's called antakkarana, inner organ. Inner organ in, in contrast to the external organs. What are the external organs? Sense organs and motor organs. These are external organs. Actually in contact with the world, physical world. The mind is not in contact with the physical world. The mind is in contact with the sense organs and the uh, motor, uh, organs of execution, motor organs. So the mind is in contact with the uh, inner world and it takes information from the senses. Senses are in contact with the actual external world. So sense, senses are called external organs. But this whole thing, the chitta, is called inner organ. Um, inner organ of knowledge. Yes. So, in the, in the case of, so this subtle body, it's hmm. not subtle, right? And then you're saying it connects with the gross body, which is the senses. Yes. So, in the case of dementia, is there a break between a subtle and the gross body? No, both are affected. Remember, all this is part of nature. So, if there is a deep-seated problem in the physical body, say dementia or something, it will have effect on the outer, the physical body, but also it will affect the, the inner functioning of, of, uh, of the intellect, of the memory, all of that will be affected. Chitta and Antakarana are the same? Um, uh, yes, here Chitta and Antakarana are the same. Now, an important question. Again, the word Chitta has a specific meaning, not here, but in Vedanta. It has a specific meaning, memory. So when Shankaracharya sings, Mano buddhyahankara chittani naham, I am not the mind, all right, check. I am not the ego, buddhi, check. I am not the I, ahankar. Notice, the real I is not the ego. Who is the real I? Uh -huh. So I am not I, the purusha, I am not this ego. It's a, ego is a function of the mind. It's a movement of the inner organ. But then he goes on to say another important point. Chitta ninaham. So definitely there the chitta does not mean this chitta because then it will be double counting. Already he has dismissed this, this, this. So one more function is there which is not mentioned in uh, the yoga or Sankhya psychology. That is memory. Here they include it in mind itself. So, and they use the word chitta for the entire thing. All the, yes. Agency, yes. Uh, you mentioned that it is a function of buddhi. Buddhi and the ahankara appropriates it. I am the doer. Doership, the sense of execution, is um, the doing. Uh, I am the agent. That's there, there. But the ahankara appropriates it, and together you get the agent. The I am the agent. That's uh, a very important difference. Yes. The, if you notice it, you will see. Suppose doership is not there. Uh, 
I can't do, I feel paralyzed. I can't do anything. But the ego is still there. Now the ego does not feel like the doer anymore. It's being done to me, but I can't do anything. There's a separation of ego and doership there. All right. Now all of this together, these internal uh, activities together are known as the chitta. And their activities are known as vritti. Vritti. Vritti means the activity. You can understand it this way. If the chitta is like the sea, vritti is like the waves. Antakarana chitta are the same. What we call antakarana in Vedanta is called chitta here. So, chitta compare it to the sea, then the vrittis are the waves. The waves are not different from the sea. They are the activity of the sea. So, the activity can be of different types. One type of activity is understanding, buddhi. One type of activity is ego, ahankara. That's also an activity of the mind. One type of activity is thinking, perceiving, that's in the mind, mind plus sense organs. So this is called chitta. And the cessation of the movements, the activity, the restlessness is, is continuously moving. Things are happening there all the time, right now also. In fact, the yogis, they consider even sleep. So I'm not, nothing is happening, I'm feeling very dull and sleepy. That sleep is also a function of the chitta. The chitta gets resolved, it stops moving for some time, that's also a function. So according to the yogis, deep sleep is also a function of chitta in, in the Sankhya or yoga psychology. All of these functions, they have to stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Swamiji, how does the Pacha Mahabhuta and Tanmatra, how does that really, what's the function of that with relation to chitta? So the chitta, uh, these Pancha Tanmatras and Pancha Mahabhutas, they go out to, uh, to make up the external world. They make up the external world. And the chitta also, the physical basis of chitta is also the subtle, subtle panchabhutas. Uh, that also goes to make up our individual minds. Uh, so that gives like the physical substrate of all of this. Since the subtle body is involved here, if the, if the uh, earth body dies, that is not the chitta yoga. No, no it's not that. The gross body is, comes after this. Physical world and gross, gross body, all of them come after the five gross elements. Up to this is a subtle world. When this physical body falls apart, this subtle body will go away into other lives. Consciousness remains constant. Yes. Swamiji, the gross, for the gross body, trace back the source is prakriti. All of this, the source is prakriti. So based on the... Everything in this universe, source is prakriti. Yes, certainly. So all of these are made of Satvarajas Tamas. All, everything that is produced from Prakriti is made of Satvarajas Tamas. Because its source material is Satvarajas Tamas. So Buddhi is made of Satvarajas Tamas. Ahankara, Manas, the sense organs, the motor organs, the subtle elements, and the gross elements, and everything in the universe is ultimately made of Satvarajas Tamas. Yes. So, Miji, how do you separate the gross elements from the physical the physical nature of everything are the gross elements. Everything according to this, this kind of cosmology, everything that we experience in this universe, whatever we see, whatever we hear, smell, taste, touch, matter, is, if you break it down, it's nothing other than uh, space and, and air and fire and water and earth. Yeah. So that was their way of understanding, yes. It doesn't come. So according to Sankhya philosophy, these two are eternal realities, Purusha and Prakriti. They have coexisted forever and they interact with each other. Nature is eternal, beginningless and endless. It will not disappear. It has been there forever and it will continue to be there. It just keeps changing. When it resolves, everything resolves back into Prakriti, that is called the dissolution of the universe. But Prakriti remains, Satvarajas Tamas remains. And then when it vibrates again, and the entire universe is produced. And this goes through cycles. Purusha remains constant. In Sankhya, there are many Purushas. Many, many. Each of us is an individual Purusha. Infinite consciousness, but many. How can there be many infinites? They give the example of light. So one light, when you switch it on, it pervades the entire room. If you switch on another light, that also pervades the entire same room. 
So the entirety of Prakriti is pervaded by consciousness and many consciousnesses. And these consciousnesses, they get entangled with subtle bodies, with minds and intellects. And then they feel, I am this one. And they forget their own nature. And then they think, I am a body or a mind. I'm a body-mind. And then samsara begins for them. So all of Maya is the, int the interweaving of Purusha and Prakriti, or is Purusha confusing itself? For With Prakriti, Prakriti, yes. That's basically what Yes. Maya so is. that is, yes. But remember, they don't use the term Maya. They use the term Prakriti. Okay. It is this thing which later on Vedanta takes the Prakriti of Sankhya and Yoga and adds it to Brahman, makes it the power of Brahman. Remember, here the two are separate. But there in Vedanta, what it was, Shankara does is, he merges Prakriti back into Purusha and says it is just the power of Brahman, like fire and its burning power. They are not two different things. So consciousness and its power is Prakriti. There he does not use the term Prakriti. Sometimes he does, but most, the term Maya is introduced. Huh. So the Maya of Advaita Vedanta has its genealogy, its roots in the Prakriti of Sankhya. Yes. No, no. All, all of them, um, ahankara is traceable to prakriti. Remember, ahankara has two aspects. One is consciousness and one is the ego. Yes. So the, the ahankara itself is always part of prakriti or maya. But there is behind it, see the whole thing in spiritual life, in Sankhya, Yoga or in Vedanta, you can put it in this way. The ego, ahankara, what does it refer to? What by I meaning referred to, what I mean is, every word refers to something. When I say chalk, chalk is a word, it's a sound. What does it refer to? This. This. So word refers to something, object, as a meaning. The philosopher Wittgenstein, there's a story about him. He used to teach in Cambridge. Um, so he was talking about word and meaning. Uh, so he raised the chalk in the class, it seems. And he asked, what is this? And one of the students said, sir, it's a chalk. He said, chalk is a word. And he threw the chalk and he hit the, the student and said, is that a word? <laughs> That's a thing. The difference between word and thing, we confuse after, sometimes it becomes same for us because we continuously use words. But what does a word refer to? When you say chalk, it's a sound. It refers to this object. Mic, it's a sound. It refers to this object. I is a word, a sound, what does it refer to? What does it refer to? Ahankara. Ahankara, yes. What does, ahankara is I. What does it refer to? What does it mean? Which is the object? Show me the object. Ah, Victoria said body-mind. I am this. Ah. So it refers to this chitta and also the physical body, sense organs, karmendriya, all of that together, body-mind complex is the reference of the I. And uh, Vedanta, Sankhya, Yoga, they say this is the problem. I does not refer to body-mind. That is the ahankara. The real I is beyond the body-mind. That is purusha, consciousness. That is totally forgotten. That purusha itself, Shining upon the Prakriti, forgetting itself, thinks I am this. And uses the I, which is a product of the Prakriti, to refer to itself as I am this. As long as it refers to itself as I am this, samsara will continue for it. So Pleasure and pain, hold on, yeah. Pleasure and pain, life after life, seeking to protect this body and mind, to give it a lot of pleasure, to avoid the pain for this body and mind, it goes on like that. Now what is spirituality? It is shifting the reference of the I from body-mind, all right, mind-body, to consciousness, purusha. Shifting the reference of the I from the products of prakriti back to purusha. You wanted to say? If, yeah, they're, they're later, if you think about it that way. Swami Vivekananda said, Kapila, the founder of the Sankhya system, he is the oldest philosopher, the early, first philosopher of the human race, Kapila. Uh, if you, you, find, you may find interesting similarities with Advaita, 
because we are all familiar with Advaita, and interesting dissimilarities also with Advaita. What are the similarities? Pure consciousness. I am consciousness. When Shankaracharya sings, Mano buddhi hankara jittani naham, I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the uh, ego, I am not the memory, you can easily see, check, 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 yes, I am not these things, I can cross them out. Then he sings, Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham, I am of the nature of Shiva, I am of the nature of consciousness and bliss. Correct. But what is the difference? The difference is, first of all, in Advaita Vedanta there is only one consciousness. There are not many consciousnesses, we are not many. We are one consciousness at that level. Many bodies and minds, but one consciousness. That's one. Second, in Advaita Vedanta, most importantly, Prakriti is not apart from Purusha. Prakriti is not a real thing separate from Purusha. Prakriti is the power of Purusha. Purusha itself is projecting all this. That beautiful story by, um, by uh, what's his name? The, the book, Alan Watts. Do you remember the story? What is this whole life? The story goes like this. God existed from eternity to eternity. Then God, because existing eternity to eternity all alone is boring. So God got very bored. And God wanted to play, but did not have any friends. Whom will God play with? So he thought for a long time. But because he is God, he is very clever. So he got a solution. What is the solution? God pretended to be not God. Now there were two. God and not God. Now the play could start. What is God pretending to be not God? God pretending to be not God, Prakriti and the products of Prakriti. And now the play could start. But what is the problem? Because God is awfully good at what he does. He is an expert, really great, because he's God. So he is really good at what he does. So when he pretended to be not God, he did such a thorough job of it, now he can't remember who he is. <laughs> and now God pretending to be not God, totally forgotten that he is God, is searching for himself or its own, his own real nature and that is samsara. What a beautiful story because the whole story of Sankhya which is borrowed entirely by yoga, the story of Sankhya is exactly that. What is the whole story according to Kapila, according to Sankhya? What's going on here is Purusha and Prakriti are interacting. Prakriti does two things for Purusha. Purusha does one thing for Prakriti. Purusha lends Illumination, consciousness, experience. Without Purusha, no experience is possible. Without consciousness, no experience is possible. Just take an ordinary product of Prakriti, um, like, uh, say, a computer, which can do everything. It has got intellect. It has got, a, like, a, not a conscious sense of self, but a sense of self. It can act as if it, it is, knows itself distinct from others. And it can consider things. It has got sensors. It has got, all, you know, like a robot or something. All of these things are possible for a computer. Yet there is no internal experience. There is no subjective experience. We were talking about it yesterday. Deep Blue defeated Grandmaster. Grandmaster may feel humiliated. Why? <coughs> Purusha. Con connected. Consciousness connected with this intellect. This intellect has been defeated. And the flash of defeat here is experienced by the Purusha as humiliation. <coughs> But in the case of the computer, this is not there. Only these things are going on. There is no internal experience. So, Prakriti is illumined by Purusha and Prakriti gives experience to Purusha of two types. Bhoga apavarga. Bhoga means experience. What kind of experience? Pleasure and pain. Sukha dukkha. And apavarga is a very ancient word for liberation. Moksha, nirvana, kaivalya. One of the most ancient words is apavarga. Now out of use these days. But three, four thousand years ago, apavarga means um, withdrawal or release. Prakriti gives that. So what does Prakriti give? Body, mind, ego, <coughs> intellect, a universe. Go out there and play. Have fun and suffer. All of these things, whatever you can experience, the worst of sufferings, the greatest of achievements, everything, life after life, human life, animal life, plant life, all of this you experience. At one time, this soul, which is Purusha plus Prakriti, it wants freedom from it all. Can I become all? Can I become free of these limited existences? 
And Prakriti then says, all right, come to Yoga Sutra. Here is the book for you. Uh, come to Vedanta retreat. And so the path to liberation is uh, opened up by Prakriti. Both are given by Prakriti. I come, I'm coming to you, both of you. Notice how in Vedanta this whole idea became saying that the keys to Brahma Jnana are in the hands of the Divine Mother. Uh, so uh, you have to please the Divine Mother because she will let you free. She, um, spirituality and materiality, both are in the realm of Maya. Yes. The, the Ananda aspect of it? Yes. Yeah, they don't mention it. Okay. It is awareness and existence, but not bliss is not mentioned. Whereas Sankhya does not mention bliss, Yoga does not mention bliss. It is of the nature of peace, beyond suffering. That's it. It's very interesting. The most ancient philosophies, Buddhism, um, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga, they talk about overcoming suffering, the second arrow. And leave you there, that's it. You are beyond suffering. But even more ancient are the Upanishads, Vedanta, which talks about ananda, bliss, joy. So, but the joy definitely, you have to understand, it's not a feeling. To have any kind of feeling, particular feeling, particular experience, particular knowledge, what do you need? This. Yeah. All right. Now let's go on a little further. Yes. One quick question on this. So you said that in Vedanta, uh, Purusha and Prakriti are like fire and the power to burn. Hmm. Whereas in the Yoga Sutras, they are separate. They are separate. They are separate. Hmm. So does that then mean that uh, Prakriti cannot exist without Purusha? Can Purusha exist without Prakriti? In Sankhya or Yoga, Purusha and Prakriti can exist separately. They do exist separately. Yeah. Interact. They matter. Time, space, matter, energy is an independent reality. Consciousness is an independent reality. They interact, and when they interact in ignorance, samsara results. This is very much like what David Chalmers is proposing as panpsychism now. What is materialism? What is the problem um, of materialism in modern science? They are saying, basically modern science is saying, this is real. They don't talk about Sattva Rajas Tamas, they talk in terms of uh, matter, time, space, energy, and this is real. And what is Purusha? What is consciousness? This is born from this. This is also a product, like all of this is also a product of, um, of um, nature. In a physical body, living body, living brain, consciousness somehow originates. But the trick is in that somehow. How? Somehow is not an answer. How? And if you cannot answer that how, then the hard problem of consciousness comes in. Uh, and David Chalmers says, we may have to admit a crazy idea that matter is fundamental and real, time, space, matter, energy, and one more fundamental thing could be consciousness. If you say that, you are back to 5,000 years ago what Kapila said. What's his name, David? David Chalmers. Hard problem of consciousness? He's in NYU, yes. Yes, you had a question. Yes. Or Maya is not a real separate thing. Yes. None of this exists apart from, this is really Brahman, it seems to be apart from Brahman, it seems to be a real independent Prakriti, it's not, according to Advaita Vedanta. Yes. It's possible, it's valid, but it's not necessary. Advaita will say, we'll see in the next class. Advaita will say, you are consciousness, regardless of Prakriti. And all you have to do is know yourself as consciousness. 
that I have to settle Prakriti into a particular state of calmness. My mind has to be settled into a particular state of yogic calmness. Then only I will know myself as Purusha. That's not true. You can, even in this state where the mind is moving, active, engaged with the world, thinking, feeling, enjoying, suffering. Even here, are you Purusha or not? Yes, you are. It should be possible to know yourself as Purusha. And if you know yourself as Purusha, the question is, upon what does your freedom depend? <coughs> upon what does your freedom depend? Does it depend upon calming the mind, which is a product of Prakriti, putting the mind into Samadhi? That gives you freedom. Or realizing yourself as Purusha, which is ever free anyway, that gives you freedom. If realizing yourself as Purusha, Aham Brahmasmi, if that gives you freedom, then you realize that way, whatever form necessary. Why is it necessary to put the mind in a particular form? Samadhi. One Uttarakhand Sadhu said, uh, in Hindi he said, if, if your moksha lies, if your freedom, peace, freedom lies in Samadhi, he said in Hindi, lo, lo apne pyare ko samadhi ke jail khane mein band kar diya. See, you put your beloved, that means God or whatever, your spiritual. You put your beloved in the jail of Samadhi. As long as I'm in Samadhi, it's all right. When I'm out of Samadhi, it's not all right. Vedanta Advaita would say, no, 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 that's a serious mistake. So anyway, that will come to later on. But I'm taking the Vedantic perspective. What would the yogic perspective be? The yogi, one yogi told me once, I asked him, don't you like, he was doing Samadhi, practicing Samadhi in the high Himalayas. He used to live in a cave. Um, I said, what about Vedanta? Don't you like Vedanta? And he said, yeah, it's all right. They talk a lot. They don't have experience. <laughs> hmm. So the yogic response to all this will be, lots of tall talk, mister. <laughs> but <laughs> do you really know what you're talking about? Have you experienced it? So, yeah. So there are two, two perspectives. And there's a lot of discussion, which is correct. Because Advaita happily uses this, uh, the techniques. They are all used for meditation. Totapuri taught all of this to uh, Sri Ramakrishna to attain Samadhi. So all of these are used by Advaita. They are very powerful, very useful. See, Advaita uses the logical argumentation techniques from Nyaya. Advaita takes the whole concept of pure consciousness from Sankhya. And meditation techniques from Yoga. So... But the approach is different. The whole philosophical approach is different. Who else had a question? Okay. Yes. Only one, let me ask, we have made a valid point, but one little correction. This illusory stuff, we are too conditioned by Vedanta. <laughs> Sankhya and Yoga will say, this is not at all illusory. They are all very much real. Prakriti is real, nature is real, mind, body, everything is real. And you as consciousness are also real. Two reals have gotten mixed up and the difference is not clear. The difference has to be understood and for that we need the help of the mind. The mind is the source of the confusion, here, Chitta. And it will also clear up the confusion. But you are saying that the mind is needed. Correct, in one sense, that is the whole purpose of Prakriti in, in Sankhya. Prakriti is needed by Purusha for what? Experience. And Prakriti is needed by Purusha for what? For release, moksha. Only thing is, when Purusha gets that moksha, it realizes I have always been free. <laughs> but right now, it needs this. It needs all of this to be engaged in the world and to get freedom from the world also. To come to the Vedanta retreat in Star Lake, you need body, you need mind, and you need all of nature. Yeah. The question becomes even more serious in Advaita Vedanta. Here the two real things are there and they are cooperating with each other. Understandable. They give a nice example in Sankhya. These are very old, old examples, even before the Sutra literature. A few nice stories are there. Very interesting. One is, Purusha and Prakriti, they are like a lame man and a blind man. The blind ma man cannot see and the lame man cannot go anywhere. But what they do is the, the blind man puts the lame man on his shoulders 
and the blind man tells the, la uh, the, the, the lame man tells the blind man where to go and what is he seeing and all of that. And the, lame man, uh, the, uh, the blind man carries the lame man wherever he wants to go. So the blind man is nature, mat material nature. And the lame man is consciousness. Consciousness cannot do anything by itself. But everything is done. Anything means nothing physical can be done by consciousness because consciousness is not physical. Nothing mental can also be done by consciousness because consciousness is not the mind. But everything can be experienced only by consciousness. Matter can do everything. Matter, energy, time, space can do everything but can't experience anything. Now you'd say, what kind of philosophy is this? This is the most basic kind of philosophy. If you think carefully about it, you don't need any scripture to come to this. Just sheer logical analysis of our experience will drive you to this. Think about it. All our experience, all experience, whatever you have done in life, whatever anybody can do in life and experience in life, has this structure, subject, object. If you investigate the object, you will find nature, prakriti. If you investigate the subject, you will find at the back of it, consciousness. This is the basic idea behind Kapila, brilliant idea. And he stops here. Another idea was given by a great um, professor of religion, Chicago University, many years ago, Mircha Eliad. He went to India, he, I think he was Hungarian or some, or Romanian. He went to India, at that, he met Rabindranath Tagore, he studied under Surendranath das, das Gupta in Calcutta, he stayed there. Um, Mircha Eliad. Then he came back to the West, he came to USA, and he became a very noted philosopher, of, a, a professor of religion. So in one of his books, he has written good books on yoga. Uh, in one of his books he says, notice that Sankhya comes to Purusha and Prakriti and stops there. After this, after Kapila, comes Buddha and then Shankara. And what did they, what did they do? Buddha pushes the Purusha into Prakriti. He denies that there is anything like Purusha. Only a whirling mass of matter. If you realize that, you are free. And what does Shankara do? He pushes Prakriti into Purusha and calls it Brahman. So the two rebellious children of Kapila, one is Buddha and one is Shankara. Shankara. Uh, Shankara. Yes. No, Jivan Mukta is calming down the Prakriti. What is the purpose of calming down Prakriti? We will see. Next sutra, let us see. What will happen when you calm it down? Hmm. You know, in many places they talk about going beyond the gunas as well. Hmm. So when we, uh, when the chitta is calm, calm then it automatically you go beyond the gunas? Right, what happens? It's a good question. What is calmness of the chitta? One way of understanding is, is quietening down the vrittis, the movements of the chitta. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, perceptions, stop. Samadhi. Another way of looking at the same thing is that reduce the rajas and tamas of the chitta and make it very sattvic. That sattvic chitta easily goes into samadhi. Spirituality is basically, in terms of sattva, rajas, tamas, Increase the sattva guna, maximize it, and reduce these two. Then what will happen? Then that highly sattvic chitta will reveal to you that you are not the chitta. You are beyond the chitta, purusha, always beyond the three gunas. Gita keeps telling you, go beyond the three gunas, go beyond... The, what, what does it mean, go beyond the three gunas? Now you can understand. You are identified with the body-mind which are products of the three gunas. You are playing in a samsara which are the product of the three gunas. But your real nature is Purusha, which is beyond the three gunas. Realize yourself as Purusha, that is going beyond the three gunas. Um, Sri Ramakrishna explains very nicely. He says, a man was going in a forest and he was caught by three robbers. One robber wanted to kill him, Tamas. Another robber wanted to bind him and rob him of all his wealth, Rajas. And they did that. Luckily, Tamas was not able to kill. Rajas said, let's just bind the fellow and leave him there. But the third robber was kind-hearted. They all robbed him nicely, but then the <laughs> robber was kind-hearted. He set him free and took him to the road and said, this is a safe area. Oh. <laughs> so you can, 
and uh, you can go back in this way. You can call an Uber or something like that, and and don't come in this neighborhood. Uh, and this man was so happy. He said, "You come with me. You save me." Stockholm syndrome. Uh, Stockholm syndrome. You say, uh, "You saved me. The, you come with me to back to my house, to the city." And uh, this sattva, the robber said, "No, I cannot go with you. I cannot go with you there. That is beyond my range because I am a robber too. My limit is here. You can go there because you are this actually." So that's a nice story. Sri Ramakrishna said, "Even sattva does not give you enlightenment. It just it is just a stage for enlightenment. It's necessary. All spirituality." Your um, uh, tapasya, your moral life, your fasting, your prayer, your puja, your meditation, study, um, discipline, all of that is meant to increase sattva and reduce these two. But even that sattva is not the ultimate goal. You have to go beyond the three gunas. Go beyond means you are beyond the three gunas. You had a question? I'm come to you. Now we'll come to that now. So what is all this then? What is the result of it? Yoga, Shishtabhiski, Nirodha, then what is the result? Third Sutra, let us come. Please repeat. Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha We don't have much time, let me do the third and fourth Sutras quickly. So what is the purpose of all this? Why should I take all the trouble to calm down the mind and attain samadhi? And there will be a whole process for that. You know, uh, Sutra will talk about Ashtanga Yoga, Yama, Niyama, moral disciplines, then Asana, sitting, then Pranayama, breathing. We have to learn how to sit and breathe, yes. <laughs> we are not sitting properly. A yoga teacher would be annoyed at all the postures he will see in this room. And we are not breathing properly also. B.K.S. Iyengar, who was one of the, the source of Iyengar Yoga in the West, he writes in his book, when he first opened the yoga studios here, Westerners would come and learn yoga. He said they were hardly breathing. They are so tense, the shallow upper body breathing. So hardly using their lung capacity. No wonder disease comes. Anyway, so pranayama. Uh, then we have Pratyahara, withdrawal from the world outside. Five sense organs, starting outside. Then dharana, focus. Instead of scattered chitta vritti, focus, one chitta vritti. All chitta vritti is reduced to one. That focus will deepen into uh, dhyana, meditation. That meditation deepens into samadhi, complete absorption, where the entire world is blanked out, one vritti alone remains, sampragyata samadhi. Then that one vritti also goes away, asampragyata samadhi. It is revealed to you that you are not the mind. And then let's quickly do the third and fourth sutras. Third sutra. What will happen then? Tada drashtu swarupe avasthanam. <coughs> Tada, then, when, when, when your mind, the chitta vrittis have ceased, when you are in samadhi, then, drashtu, the seer, who is the seer? Here physical seeing is not meant, not even mental seeing. Awareness, consciousness, purusha, the seer, swarupe, in own nature, or own form, rupa means form, avasthana, stays, abides, abides. The purusha abides in its real nature then, when the mind is in samadhi. When the mind is in absolutely calm, in samadhi, you remain in your real nature. God remains as God. God is recognizable as God in the language of Alan Watts. Remember, Sankhya does not use the term God at all. Yoga uses the term God, 
but as the first teacher, Hiranyagarbha, in that sense. That is the purpose. Here Swami Vivekananda comments, what happens is, like a lake, where all the waves and ripples have ceased, it's one shining calm surface. And the water is absolutely crystal clear. Two conditions, no waves, clear water. Clear water means the mind must be pure, sattvic. And no waves means samadhi. You say, will a kind of sat sattvic mind be disturbed? Yes, disturbed means not in a bad sense, but you can, I have seen many pure and simple people, uh, like sadhus have seen, but also very restless. <laughs> But that restlessness can easily be dealt with. They can, if they want, they can settle down in meditation like nobody else. Very pure. That restlessness is more like the restlessness of a child. We are restless deep inside. We are complicated people. They are restless on the surface. Inside they are very simple. <laughs> Sri Ramakrishna, you wouldn't think of him as restless. When he had to go to Calcutta to somebody's house, the carriage would be called. He would be the first one to jump on the carriage and sit. Waiting for him. Yeah. I have seen monk, very senior monks, spiritually advanced, they have to go on a, on a train journey. Hours and hours ahead of schedule, they go and sit in the station. <laughs> There's something there, I don't know what happens. I think when you are at that level, you will understand that probably. Uh, so then, what happens? When the lake is absolutely clear and no waves are there, you see through to the bottom. Do you remember the story the yogi told me on the bank of the river Ganga in, in Himalayas? In the winter, if you come, Swami, you will see the same river. Few thoughts are there, no ripples. And the, the water is so clear, not muddy, so clear. He said in Hindi, oh, there's a wooden bridge there. O bridge se chavanni, pul se chavanni bhi gira doge, wo dekh paoge. If you throw a quarter from the bridge, and it falls into the river and sinks to the bed of the river. You can read up the denomination of the coin from the top of the bridge. It's so clear and still. It almost is, it doesn't seem to be there at all, but it's water. And for plains folk like us, when, when, at that time we're not used to snow and ice. I remember, <laughs> uh, we have time up to 12, right? Yeah. Yeah. First time I, enc I encountered these mountain streams, I was going up to the Himalayas and the bus dropped me off. It was getting evening. I had to find my log cabin, otherwise you'd be at, at, in 10,000 feet in the Himalayas without a place to stay. And night is falling. The result is you're going to freeze to death the on the first night in the Himalayas. Anyway, so I saw this little stream running across the road. Very clear water. I thought, okay, it's nice. It's, it's, it's just a little bit of water. I can walk across it. When I started walking, it's so cold, just ice melted. After some time, my legs became numb. I could barely move in the water. <laughs> I got across. Okay. Yes. Is that the vision that you call as God when you see the bottom of the lake? Yes. That's the, if you use that language, they don't use that language. He says this. Then the seer, who is the seer? You. Swarupe, in your real nature. What is your real nature? Not body, not mind, as awareness. Avasthanam, abides. Yes. Well, in number two, that is Yoga Chitra Vitti Niroda, no waves. Then where is the clear water coming in? Assumed already. Yama Niyama. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That is why, do you remember the Shankara's, the Advaita Vedanta matrix of sadhana? Mm -hmm. Three levels. Chitta Shuddhi, purity of mind, clearing the water. Then ekagrata, focus of mind, stilling the waves. Then jnana comes. It's not all that different. Yeah, you see? Practically, it's not all that different. The reason why we cannot still the waves is because the water is not clear. Uh, yes. Swami, so if somebody follows the Sankhya philosophy and they are enlightened, hmm. they say two, because the ones who follow the Advaita Vedanta, like Ramakrishna say, not to one. Hmm. Yes, but they will say two. Because why? Moment you say something, you're already down to the level of concepts and speech. 
That's an interesting point because Advaita Vedanta, what Sri Ramakrishna says, the ultimate reality is the same, but is a big problem there. It is beyond language and concepts. The moment you drag it down to the level of language and concepts, all your religious philosophical conditioning will come into play. The Sankhyan will come back from Samadhi and say, I experienced myself as Purusha apart from Prakriti. The, the Advaitin will say, I realized I am Brahman, one existence of the universe. Which one is correct? Take your pick. Um, the yogi or the devotee will say, I became one with my Krishna. Huh? Buddha says you come to Shunya. What is that? We'll see later. <laughs> yeah, but you can, you can, can you not understand it that way? If Prakriti entirely disappears from, for, from you, then in that sense it will seem like a void, a complete emptiness. And you can, can you describe it as Shunya? Yes, you can. Void. Void of what? Void of material nature. No world, no body, no thoughts, no mind. It's a void. So is it nothing? No, no, no. It is something. Consciousness is there. I once had this argument with my teacher, Nirod Baran Chakravarti. He was a philosophy professor who had retired and used to teach us brahmacharis in, in our monastery. So I was very enamored by Shunyavada uh, of Nagarjuna, the philosophy of the void. I said, that's the ultimate conclusion you can come to. I mean, I don't want your uh, Upanishad saying that that is Brahman and all of that. That's your believing that. But practically in experience and logic shows you it's a void. <laughs> and he gave a very incisive thing, which I understood much later. He, he was a short man, disciple of Swami Abhedananda. Big eyes. And he looked at me with those big eyes and he said, Ah, but who knows the void? The void to whom? All right. Then last one, fourth one. At that time, the consciousness ab abides in its real nature. At other times, the question arises now, then other times, what's happening? Vritti sarupya mitaraktra. Vritti sarupya mitaraktra, fourth one. Vritti, modification of the mind. Sarupyam, identification. Itaratra, at other times. Itaratra means at other times. Other than what time? Samadhi. You see how it's connected. Itaratra, other than other times. Other than what? Other than then. Then means when? When, when the mind is in, in Samadhi. When the mind is in Samadhi, then the witness remains in its real nature as pure consciousness. At other times, the witness becomes identified with the modifications of the mind. You see, this is how you read the sutras. Anger comes in the mind. I am angry. Not that I am the consciousness which is the witness of the wave of anger in the mind. No. I am mad at you. Like this. Atha Yoga Anushasanam now starts the instruction on yoga. What is yoga? Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Yoga is the cessation of the vrittis of the chitta. And remember, what is chitta, what is vritti, like the sea and the waves. So, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Why? What will happen then? What's the point? Tada, then. Then the witness will remain in its real nature. What real nature? Consciousness. Bring in all of the Sankhya philosophy there. Purusha, you will remain as Purusha. Then at other times, if then you remain as Purusha consciousness, at other times what happens? At other times, the, you, you will be identified with the vritti. Whatever is happening in the mind, you will get mixed up with that. It's true actually. It's a literal statement of the truth. What Advaita, so this you got it? This is the way to read it. What Advaita objects to is this language. Swarupi avasthanam itaratra at that time, the witness remains in his pure consciousness nature. Advaita will say the witness always remains in his pure conscious na nature. At other times, it's identified with... Why? At other times also, it's, it's actually... It's not that time or other time. It's knowing yourself and not knowing yourself. The actor, say Mr. Smith, who plays Macbeth in the role in, the, in Shakespeare in the park. When he's playing Macbeth, he's still Mr. Smith. 
He has no problem there because he knows I'm Mr. Smith. He doesn't think I'm Macbeth. He feels like and acts like Macbeth to the best of his ability. And when he's not acting as Macbeth, he still knows I'm Mr. Smith. It's not that he becomes identified with Macbeth at that time and when he stops playing Macbeth, then he is Mr. Smith. No, no, no. So is it, are they confused, yogis and Sankhyas? Actually not. If you read the Vyasa Bhashya commentary, the Vyasa admits at all times consciousness remains as consciousness. It's only mixed up with the thoughts. It only seems to be mixed up with the thoughts. Then what is the problem? Problem is not really modification of the mind. Problem is ignorance and knowledge. If you know yourself as consciousness, then even in, in Samadhi your consciousness, even while the mind has got Chitta Vritti, you are still consciousness. So, so they, even they accept ignorance is the problem. Yes. They accept ignorance is the problem. In Samadhi actually what happens, they call it Viveka Khyati. The difference becomes obvious. Khyati, flash. Viveka, separation. The separation between Purusha and Prakriti becomes obvious in Samadhi. Once it's obvious, even when you're out of Samadhi, you know. Although I'm fully mixed up in all of this, I am none of it. Yes. If you were raised as a baby, to think that he is Macbeth, and everyone around him has always said you are Macbeth, and then he grows up and he's still Macbeth. Correct. But actually he's Mr. Smith. Maybe he has to spend time Correct. in the Mr. Smith. Correct. Environment, correct. In fact, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very... It's a very ancient story, a Sankhyan story. There are cute stories are there. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have time to mention it. So there is the son of a king. The story is a little archaic. Because of certain conditions, astrological conditions, he was exiled from the kingdom. And he was brought up by the Sabara tribe. You know, Sabaras are an ancient tribe in India. He was the forest dwellers. He was brought up by the Sabara tribe and he always thought, I am a Sabara, a forest dweller. Then many years later, the minister finds him and says, Oh, prince, you are alive. You are a prince. Come and claim your kingdom. So he comes to the understanding, Oh, I am not the Sabara, Sabara tribe, tribesman. I never was a Sabara. I thought I was, but I always was a prince. And immediately he comes into possession of his kingdom. So this is the ancient story, Sankhyan story. Yes. So then that sort of leads me to say that then our Purusha and Prakriti are separate hmm. and they exist, right, in, from like the Sankhya point of view. Hmm. And that's why sort of it leads me like the Vedantic, um, like if you kind of, uh, from a Vedantic standpoint, uh, that now and then has to be translated differently or interpreted differently so that you can sort of bring this Oh, right, you're right. The way you would, actually the way you would do it is, now and then would not refer to time of samadhi and outside time of samadhi. Now and then would refer to knowledge and ignorance. In knowledge, you realize I am pure consciousness. In ignorance, at the time of ig uh, ignorance, uh, you realize that, you feel that I am body-mind. Once you have knowledge, even when, see, uh, the way it is translated is, when Purusha, pure consciousness, is confronted with an active mind, it confuses itself with the mind and thinks of itself as the mind. And they give very nice examples. I don't have time for that. One example is, trees reflected in the lake. Sarasi eva tatad drumaha, trees reflected in the lake. The lake is like Purusha, pure consciousness. And trees are like the movements of the mind. They're reflected in the lake and it, the lake loses its and understanding of itself as water, it sees I am the trees. It never was the trees. The trees appeared in the lake. At no point the trees were in contact with the lake. So when you realize that, even when the trees are appearing in the lake, even then, at other times when the trees are appearing, then also it will think of itself, I am the water. Let the trees appear. Let as many, whole jungle let it appear. Nothing to me. Not even one tree or one twig is in me. Similarly, all thoughts and activities of the mind, let them go on. I asked a great scholar, he was the head of the Haura Pandit Samaj. Um, uh, what 
was his name? He, Saptatirtha. He was, uh, um, I keep forgetting his name. He, he was a master of Vedanta and Sankhya and Yoga and he got high degrees in each. He was 95 years at the time I met him. He died one year later. <laughs> now, we, I was in a particular meeting. He was supposed to address it. Um, and an old man, he insisted, there was a lot of trouble to take him on the stage. You need two people to lift him and put him on the stage. So even before the audience came, they had to take him up. It was a big operation to put him on the stage. So he was sitting alone in the stage. I thought, this is my chance to ask this question. What is the fundamental difference between the Advaita approach and the Sankhyan approach? So I went and you have to shout in his ear, good ear. <laughs> Advaita says this, Sankhya says that. What is the difference? He listened and one, just two words, he said. He listened like this and he said, even like this. Drishtir Patukko, difference in point of view. <laughs> it's a difference of perspective. They're talking about the same thing. But there are other big philosophical differences that Prakriti is not an independent reality, like in Sankhya. In Advaita, Prakriti is nothing other than you yourself. Advaita makes it one, non-dual. Sankhya, remember, remember, Sankhya and Yoga are staunchly, strongly dualistic. Let's repeat the verses, uh, the, the sutras. Atha Yoga Anushasanam Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodhaha Tada Drashtu Swarupe Avasthanam Swarupe Avasthanam Vritti Sarupya Mitaratra None of this will enlighten us until you meditate. <laughs> <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu